expect things to change hey, in the country during the Clinton administration? I do expect the change, but I don't know if there are going to be good changes. You know how it is. It's hard to change people when, once they um, already have a mindset on, uh, for 12 years. I mean, they've been there and they haven't done anything. So. Do you expect things to change in this country during the Clinton administration? I don't expect them to necessarily, but I think it would be, it would be good. If have better medical care for the elderly. Pharmaceuticals, they're out of sight completely. Uh, it's either take a pill or take your dinner, one or the other. Right. What kinds of changes would you make? Well, hopefully get people back to work. We do need insurance for everyone, not only people who can afford it, if we need good health care for people who can't afford insurance. Start worrying about our country yeah. first, yeah. and then help others, but make sure our country is health first. Yeah. Where, where the next paycheck is coming from is probably what you should concentrate on. Well, to help the elderly and to help the uh, homeless and be more jobs available. Let's get going. That's 100 days is almost up. Good evening and welcome to this special live version of John Birch Society Roundup here on Somerville Community Access Television. Tonight we've actually gone out and captured from his home in Lexington, Noam Chomsky, and we're holding him hostage until he recants everything that he's said over the past 30 years. I'm Barry Crimmins, and it's a pleasure to be here. Actually, this is Dead Air Live. I just know that I live in Somerville, and I get to watch the excellent John Birch Society uh, program, and you should too, because it is information that we all need to know other people believe. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Dr. Chomsky, a man who actually writes faster than I can read. Uh, <laughs> I, I, have a, uh, have, I have your stuff delivered to my house each day. Um, we're discussing uh, tonight the first 100 days of the Clinton administration and uh, change, which was the theme of the campaign. Uh, people in the, uh, in, on the street, in the, on the street interviews uh, talked about uh, health care and jobs and change. What kind of change do you think? Uh, well, the, it's true, the Clinton administration, the Clinton campaign focused on the magic word change, and the uh, Clinton, one of their main uh, uh, documents that the campaign put out was in fact entitled Mandate for Change, mm -hmm. and things were really going to be new. They didn't tell you that the phrase Mandate for Change is one that they borrowed, actually. It had been invented by uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower's PR people. Well, they were as, so innovative. Yeah. So, and in fact, that tells you about how much change you can expect. So the same kind of mandate for change that uh, Eisenhower had is the kind of mandate for change that the Clinton people have. Now, there is a mandate for change. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the general population has been uh, uh, moving almost off the spectrum of policy choices. Mm -hmm. However, it's not too well known, but uh, right through the 1980s, the same was true. So if you looked at public opinion studies through the 80s, the population was strongly opposed to almost all the uh, major Reagan policies. Right through the 80s, the general population was drifting towards a kind of New Deal style uh, uh -huh. you know, social welfare type system. I mean, the population was, when people were asked, uh, you know, would, you, would you like to have social spending or military spending, it was social spending right. by a huge margin. Right. Uh, education, welfare, health, and so on and so forth. Uh, and there has been that mandate for change all along, and there still is. Uh, and if you look at uh, uh, popular attitudes on major issues, there's pretty clear attitudes on things like health and jobs and uh, trade issues and uh, industrial policy and so on. However, if you compare those attitudes with the policy choices, the, right. the range of policy choices around, they're very remote from one another. So the mandate for change is there, but the change is not very likely to come. Well, just, uh, the health care, for example, like, did they matter-of-factly throw out the Canadian form yeah. of health care as, as even a possibility? Yeah, that's an interesting case. I mean, that's one of uh, the interesting cases. I mean, the, the business community <coughs> is almost entirely opposed to a what we call a Canadian-style program, mm -hmm. a single-payer so that, program. That, that's all you need to know with Clinton. That essentially ends it. That means the press is almost 100% opposed to it. If you mm -hmm. look at press commentary, right. uh, it's about 
it's almost unanimous in support of what they call managed competition. Mm -hmm. Now, occasionally they even tell you why. So, for example, the, the, the New York Times had a, in one of their many long studies of this, they had a very upbeat, big front page story, you know, running onto an inside page about uh, the marvels of managed competition using California as a model, and it's, it's a bureaucratic nightmare with mm -hmm. layer after layer of bureaucracy and administration and complexity mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, toward the end, they, uh, they asked uh, some health care, health uh, industry uh, executive, uh, what, about, what about the possibility of a single payer plan? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that's not politically possible. And the reason is because it offers nothing to the insurance companies. Right. Which is exactly right. Offers nothing to the insurance companies. Now, what about popular attitude? Well, you know, it depends. Well, you have to be careful in interpreting answers to questions. But a considerable majority of the population has been consistently in favor of a single-payer program. Mm -hmm. They can look across the border and see what happens. Right. Uh, as, uh, the last poll I saw just a couple of days ago was buried in the New York Times. It was about 60 percent in favor. But it's not an option. Uh, and it will not be an option until people make clamor enough and make enough pressure so as to put on the political agenda the things that they want. Uh, in this case, uh, the population has been pretty well stilled. Uh, uh, the, prog the program that will be initiated, uh, we sort of see the contours of it, will in fact leave plenty of uh, room for the insurance companies and it will still be a bureaucratic nightmare with, I mean, the, the U.S. system as compared with, say, Canada or England or continental Europe and so on, ha spends an enormous amount on just administrative costs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that doesn't, when they make those calculations, I mean, maybe five times as much or ten times as much, not small right. numbers. Right. When they make those calculations, they don't even count in the major cost. Right. They only talk about the cost of doctors. How about the cost of the person who has to fill out those forms? Right. I mean, it's a nightmare. Uh, and it'll probably continue that way. Well, there's a case where there's a mandate for change, uh -huh. but unless there's a lot of popular pressure, the change isn't going to come. Well, I think it was telling that it seemed like Clinton was, well, Clinton was telling us during the campaign that we needed to run this country more like a corporation. And I, I sort of think it already is run an awful lot like an awful lot of corporations. Well, it, uh, it, it is in one striking respect, namely the people who run it are from corporations right. or from corporate law firms or from uh -huh. investment firms and so on. And their basic concern, not surprisingly, is uh, the interests of investors. Right. Uh, and in fact, that's something that goes back to the origins of, of the republic. Uh, the, uh, and not the interest of the people that actually have to go out there and be wage slaves. Not um, the general public is uh, supposed to be. Um, there's a theory about this. The general public is supposed to be passive. They're supposed to be spectators, not participants. Uh, mm -hmm. The participants are the people, who, you know, who have uh, what they call the national interest uh, right. at heart. But the national interest primarily means the interest of the wealthy, the interest of investors, yeah, they, the interest of owners, and so on. Mm -hmm. There's never really been much of a secret about this. It's uh, and it's not very surprising that people who uh, dominate the decision-making apparatus, who can, you know, who, who control the resources, who can make the decisions that affect other people, will naturally use that power to uh, influence the government. Now, you know, the general population can make a difference, but they've got to, they've got to work on it. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are some interesting cases where popular grassroots pressure is making a difference, and is putting popular attitudes into the political arena. Uh, one striking case has to do with. Uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Oh, right. It's a very striking case. The conscience free trade agreement. Well, it's very interesting to watch the course of that. Mm -hmm. uh, this, was in, this, you know, this is an agreement which is going to bring supposedly Canada, uh, Mexico, and the United States together in a huge trading area. Right. Uh, the major question is, you know, the, the big disparity is Mexico and the United States are very... See, there's never been an effort to make a free trade block between a, well, they're afraid a lot of workers from Arkansas are going to flee to Mexico well, to get see, jobs. It's, yeah, what, what, it's not so much that the workers from Arkansas... No, no, the, well, no workers the are allowed will, to really... Yeah, yeah, they, right. yeah which is right. going on anyway. Right. Right. I mean, for example, General Motors is uh, closing, planning to close about two dozen plants in 
North America, the mm -hmm. United States, and Canada, but it's the biggest <coughs> employer in Mexico because you can get labor at a fraction of the cost right. under high repression. Uh, there's no danger of unions. The union leaders can be beaten up or killed. killed. There's mm -hmm. very little in the way of environmental standards. Mm -hmm. Uh, so naturally, it's a, it's a way to shift work over there. Well, now the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, doubtless, everyone agrees, will be very good for investors. You know, mm -hmm. for, uh, what the effect will be on the general population, that's an open question. But it'll have a large effect. That's agreed. Now, strikingly, it's a secret agreement. Uh, right. It was designed to be pushed through without the general public knowing about it. And even it. people and members of Congress say they they still have, I mean, it, they have a hard time when getting a copy of the thing, well, and then it's eight Con zillion yeah. pages long. And well, what happened? We need is, your answer tomorrow. That's exactly what happened. I mean, the 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 uh, the agreement was signed by the three presidents mm -hmm. uh, in, on August twelfth, right in the middle mm -hmm. of the electoral campaign. At that point, it was still a secret agreement. Nobody knew it was in it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was then supposed to go to Congress on what's called a fast track, right. meaning Congress right. wouldn't bother looking at it. Uh, the, according to uh, U.S. trade law, uh, there is a major trade law, 1974 trade law, mm -hmm. that, that requires citizen input into trade-related issues, primarily through the labor movement. Mm -hmm. It established something they call the Labor Advisory Committee, which is supposed to provide advice and uh, 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 and analysis on any trade-related right. legislation. That's the main citizen input. Well, you know, they were informed that their report is due in mid-September, September, September mm -hmm. 9th. They were given the document, a couple of thousand pages of text, one day before to ensure that they couldn't even meet, you know. I mean, utter contempt for democracy. Uh, no, uh, and in fact, to this day, we would remove a lot. It could pass the way the, the way Bush is trying to push it through. From what I can understand, it would literally m remove a lot of the constitutional authority that the Congress had. In fact, that's part of the purpose of it: is to take away authority from democratically elected bodies right. that are, whether state or local or federal, and put them in the, and, and uh, lock them into a treaty arrangement. Uh, which w where decisions will be made by executive commissions, mm -hmm. uh, mostly of representatives of business corporations or lawyers and so on, but the public won't influence it. Well, the striking thing about this is that although it was being pushed through as a relatively, as a virtually a secret executive agreement, mm -hmm. and although Congress had abdicated any role, and although the business community is overwhelmingly for it, and the press is just about 100 percent for right. it, nevertheless, Sounds the public good. has been opposed. Uh, and what's more, that public opposition took sufficient form so that it is now threatening the down. passage of the legislation. Right, right now, they, can't, they probably can't pass it in its present form. Well, who, well, I mean, what elected official who doesn't have a chance to read something that's that extensive and that far-reaching could, could go back to uh, his or her constituency and say, I made an informed decision. Well, I see the, the difference between this and health care is striking. In both this case and the health care case, the public has pretty well, I mean, mm -hmm. there is a majority opinion. In the NAFTA case, that opinion has uh, turned into activism, mm -hmm. and it has therefore compelled the administration to respond to it. Uh, and they're trying to f evade the public pressure. In fact, okay. just, just the public pressure really has to do it's not the issue isn't should there be an agreement or shouldn't there the issue is what kind <coughs> of an agreement should there be right the current agreement the one they're trying to ram through uh, protects property rights right it protects the rights of property and wealth period mm -hmm. nothing about environmental right. rights nothing about workers, workers rights. safety etc uh, the public pressure is mm -hmm. trying to put in teeth in the uh, to enforce uh, labor rights and uh, environmental protection mm -hmm. now just a couple of days ago, almost in secret, the uh, Clinton administration an, uh, announced that they are not going, that there will be no teeth in the, uh, there, there are several commissions that look into labor mm -hmm. rights and mm -hmm. uh, environmental protection, but they said, well, these will just be advisory commissions. Uh, they won't even be able to carry out investigations only what they called studies, and then they'll, they'll be able to give advice, but no they enforcement. Advise them that we wish now, someone you know, could if the general investigate this. Yeah, that sort of thing. Now, again, here, here's a clear case where democracy could function mm -hmm. if the public does become organized, if the grassroots groups, which are mostly labor, environmental, religious, and other groups, if they be, are, remain active on the issue, well, they can uh, force through those changes. Otherwise not. And if they don't, 
some of those jobs that the gentleman on the top of the show is talking about are gone. Well, they're drifting that way anyway, right. and they'll continue to. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, there's a very clear agenda here. The agenda is to protect the rights of the wealthy and to protect the rights of property. The general public may, what happens is the country may decline, mm -hmm. but the U.S.-based industry and U.S.-based investment, that's doing quite well. Right, and uh, we were discussing before we went on the air about Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe fits right into this. I mean, take, say, let's be concrete, take General Motors, mm -hmm. biggest corporation. Uh, they're closing 24 <coughs> plants here, or trying to. Uh, they're the biggest employer in Mexico, because they can get very cheap labor in a kind of high repression, low wage area. Right. They're also opening plants in Eastern Europe. Uh, they just opened a uh, big high tech uh, $700 million plant in East Germany. And the international financial press, the business press, is very frank about what it's about. I mean, they say, look, they're, they're opening with very high expectations. There's tremendous unemployment, mm -hmm. almost 50% unemployment. Mm -hmm. They can get wages, I'm now quoting, at 40% the, the uh, cost of the pampered Western workers. Western workers are pampered, pampered as far as the right. business press right. is concerned. Uh, they, uh, and there they can get them for 40% the uh, the uh, uh, wages and no benefits and longer mm -hmm. hours, so mm -hmm. that's terrific for profits. Not very good for the people in the w in the pampered, uh, you know, West. Uh, Poland's even better there. They can get them for 10% mm -hmm. of the wage level because the government's repressive enough to be able to break strikes and right. so on and so forth. Uh, they're opening plants in uh, Russia for the same reason. Uh, you get educated labor, skilled labor, very low cost, healthy people, you know, they have right. a pretty good health system, but very low cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a new third world opening right. up, which undercuts Western uh, levels. And so they again, literally could start stealing jobs from Mexico, I think. Yeah, and yeah. It, uh, it's very <coughs> frank. I mean, capital can move. You know, you can right. move investments from one place and that's, to another. That's, you can the, move the, the, that's what they're breaking the borders down and for. Exactly. You want to be able to move capital but keep labor fixed. Right. So that means if you look at the country as a geographical entity, mm -hmm. it may very well decline. If you look at the country as a place, if you define the United States as U.S.-based corporations, right. they're not declining. They're right. doing very nicely. Right. Uh, now speaking of U.S.-based workers, one of, uh, one of the flied promises of the Clinton campaigns was to, was to uh, deal with the rights of uh, laborers, labor unions, uh, seems to have that seems to have disappeared during these first hundred days. Yeah, that's a serious issue. Eight, uh, 1992 was a rather striking year in that respect. This is 1992, one very cr striking thing happened. The, uh, uh, the Caterpillar Corporation, major corporation, right, right. Uh, brought in strike breakers mm -hmm. to break a strike. Now, that hasn't happened for 60 years in a major corporation, and it's uh, is unknown in the industrial world. Mm -hmm. What we call here permanent replacement workers. Right. Well, perm scabs yeah. come in and take the jobs. Right. And replacement the worker is a replacement word for yeah. scab. Yeah. Now, the fact that a major corporation felt <coughs> strong enough to do this is an interesting reflection of the success in breaking down the labor movement and shifting power from mm -hmm. the general working population, which is just about everybody, to the, uh, to the rich and the owners. Uh, it took, uh, this was, has been going on for a long time. It took, it accelerated during the Reagan years, begin, when Reagan broke the PATCO strike. Right. Right off that, set the thing in motion. Once but, you can get rid of those people. Yeah, I, you know, once they, when Caterpillar was doing it, that really set a signal. <coughs> I mean, the Wall Street Journal had a study of executives right after that, and they said about 40% of them are planning to do the same thing. Well, mm -hmm. that's so far off the spectrum that the United States was actually condemned by the International Labor Organization, mm -hmm. UN affiliate, which is extremely rare. They never say anything negative about one of the big, rich countries. Right. Uh, but they said that the United States should review its labor practices. Well, the labor, when it supported Clinton, mm -hmm. was expecting and hoping that one of the first things that they would do in the first 100 days would be to introduce legislation to put the United States back into the spectrum of, you know, Industrial societies, right. they haven't, that's disappeared. I haven't seen anything about that. Another thing that's disappeared is uh, Clinton's commit, commitment to the Haitian people. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there was a whole <coughs> raft of campaign promises, of which one of them was to, uh, uh, to do something about uh, 
the atrocities in Haiti where the democratic government was overthrown right. in a brutal coup and it was just led to tremendous persecution and tens of thousands of refugees coming. One of the first moves that he made was to rescind those promises. Mm -hmm. uh, not only rescind them, he actually harshened the Bush program. Uh, uh, the, uh, instead of just turning back refugees on the open seas, they actually put a blockade around Haiti, right. which is radical violation of international law. You can't blockade another country. Right. Uh, they put a blockade there to make sure that refugees don't come out. Uh, there for is their some own good. That was the hmm? for their own yeah, good. That's that, you know, the best we decide what's right, for their right, good, not course. them. You know, they it's stay the and get beaten and tortured and killed because we decide that's for their right, good. Right. Uh, the uh, there is some talk about a diplomatic solution which will reinstitute the elected president, President Aristide, but I'll believe that one when I see it. Mm -hmm. My expectation is that uh, some arrangement will be worked out in which Aristide will be given the formal presidency but deprived of power. Uh, what the United States has, government has opposed is the fact that, and what really appalled them is that Aristide, President Aristide, came into power uh, with the support of a very lively yeah. grassroots movement, right. Lavalas, a sort of big popular movement, right. which was really was bringing people into act actively taking part in their own affairs. And, and that it's so funny because he's so f he's so similar to the leaders of Kuwait. You would figure the people of this country would get behind his reinstitution as, as uh, well. Aristide. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In fact, about the polar opposite. Right, right. <laughs> well, we are in that part of the world. When we talk about foreign aid a lot, and people talk in terms of foreign aid. And uh, one of the big lies that this is that we live in this incredibly benevolent country that's always mm -hmm. giving all this aid to the rest of the people in the world uh, is a linguist and uh, someone with a great deal of political insight. Could you discuss just the, the use of the I mean, aid? Well, first of all, the, the facts are worth <coughs> knowing. Uh, actually, there was a, a, a study done at the University of Massachusetts mm -hmm. on public attitude, of public awareness of campaign issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions they asked, they asked people, what do you think is the biggest item on the federal budget? Well, it's military right. by a long shot. Right. Nobody, very few people said that. What they picked was aid. Most people think that foreign aid is the biggest item on the federal budget. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's undetectable. The United mm -hmm. States is one of the lowest countries among the, you know, the OECD, the rich country, rich mm -hmm. industrial countries. The United States is one of the lowest in foreign aid. Uh, and what's called foreign aid is, in fact, a com is mostly a kind of export promotion. Right. So aid means, uh, in fact, that's why the aid doesn't go, it does not go primarily to the poorer, the needier countries, because they're not good consumers. Uh -huh. uh, if, if you look at the way the aid works, it's basically aid from the U.S. taxpayer to U.S. businesses, yeah. which enable the businesses to sell to the countries on money that the U.S. taxpayer gives them. It's a very small amount, I should say. Mm -hmm. But what there is turns out substantially to be export promotion, and in a, in a realistic sense, it doesn't leave the country. It goes from one pocket into another pocket, mm -hmm. from the pocket of taxpayers into the pockets of uh, uh, the exporters. Uh, now, sometimes the population that receives it benefits, sometimes not. Often it's harmful to mm -hmm. them because of the way it's selected. So, for example, t take something like, say, food for peace. What could be more benign than that, giving food to third world right. people? Well, you know, it's not benign. I mean, when you look at it, the effects are uh, to undercut native agriculture, mm -hmm. to make people dependent on U.S. Agri agribusiness exports, and to force them into agricultural exporting, right. uh, which incidentally often means coca uh, of exporting. Course, but that, and that, in fact, it is designed for that purpose. Mm -hmm. it looks benign. It's very uh, hardly so. Uh, you, you can see the way this has worked over decades. I mean, in the Alliance for Progress, Kennedy's Alliance for Progress was right. described as very benign in this way, and it had interesting effects. I mean, it was not surprising if you look at what they mm. proposed, but they did succeed in Latin America in, in expanding exports. So the mm. Latin American countries expanded, like take say beef. Mm -hmm. Beef exporting just Right, but there was went. no, but they got rid of the beans the people there were eating. Yeah, not only that, but beef consumption declined. Mm -hmm. Beef consumption declined, you know, beans and rice, local mm -hmm. subsistence agriculture declined. The Alliance for Progress ended up being a Tremendous gift for American. So we could overeat the wrong stuff sooner. 
well, we fast did, food we, restaurants. We, we, it was terrific for U.S. exporters mm -hmm. and for U.S. importers and for the tiny wealthy sector in Latin America, and it was a disaster for the population. Uh, and in fact, the aid program was designed for that purpose. There's, a, there's an illusion here that the rich countries give aid to the poor right. countries. It's quite the other way when around. In fa when in fact it's, the, it's, it's an elaborate ruse through which they actually bill people for stealing their natural resources. Yeah, not only that, and in fact, uh, if you look at the actual capital flows, <coughs> Uh, in the last uh, 10 years, the flow of capital from the south to the north, from the poor countries to the rich countries, is about the equivalent of six Marshall Plans. That's something like half a trillion dollars. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a, 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 even if you look at the U.S. and Mexico, mm -hmm. it's probable that Mexico subsidizes the U.S. rather than conversely. Um, no, well, we're talking about aid. Uh, you're saying there's two, two major areas for aid. Well, if you look at the very small amount of what we call aid, mm -hmm. which is mostly not aid, <coughs> the the large, the large, the biggest chunk of it by far goes to uh, two Middle East countries, Israel and Egypt, mm -hmm. which get roughly the same amount. Except remember, Egypt has ten times the population, so it means right. Israel gets much more mm -hmm. per capita, and is Israel per capita get, gets aid beyond. It's just off the chart. Right. There's nothing like it in world affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Egypt gets a lot, and then Turkey is the next recipient, all Middle East countries. Uh, and then another new block of aid that's picking up now, so-called aid, is uh, uh, Russia and parts of Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, the purposes of this, th this, these are not the poorest areas of the world by any means. Right. They're not giving aid because people need it. Right. Uh, uh, Eastern Europe, in fact, by third world standards is quite well off. Right. Uh, it used to be part of the third world pre-1917, mm -hmm. but it sort of pulled out of it. And, right. it, and, it, and in fact, what we're trying to do with the aid is return them to a third world status. We want them to be the kind of country where we can use their, we have access to their resources. Uh, American corporations like, say, GM and others can uh, uh, move production facilities there mm -hmm. and get cheap labor <coughs> as they can in Mexico. Uh, and we want them to, when we say we want them to open their markets and accept capitalist reforms, that's exactly what it means. It means turning them, re returning them, because that's what they were, mm -hmm. to a kind of third world service area. Uh, the Western countries, the rich Western countries, they don't accept these capitalist reforms. Like, we don't have them, and right. England doesn't have them, and Germany doesn't right. have them, and Japan doesn't have them, but we want the third world to have them because then they'll be able to provide the, their, serve their role, sort of, right. sources of re raw materials, and resources, and cheap labor, cheap and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the aid to the Middle East is for different reasons. I mean, that's to, uh, that's, in a, that's basically designed to ensure U.S. control over the oil production of the region. E Israel and Egypt and Turkey are mm -hmm. kind of regarded as sort of guardians of the wealthy, uh, the, the way we run the oil system is it, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of potential wealth in the Middle East and it, uh, we have to make sure, as the British did before us, that that wealth does not go to the people of the region but that it comes to the West. And the way that's handled is by having family dictatorships right. which run the oil production and invest their money and their profits in the United, in U.S. Treasury bonds and, right. you know, uh, Kuwaiti investment firm in London and so on. And they got to be protected from their populations who don't really understand why. I mean, the population of the region, you know, many, many people, uh, is not persuaded by the logic that says uh, the wealth of their region has to come to the West, not to, the, well, they're impoverished. Mm -hmm. So you need sort of protectors, and Israel and Turkey and uh, 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 Pakistan and uh, Iran when it was under the Shah are kind of these protectors. We got to support them. Uh, Egypt is the biggest Arab country, and they got to be bought off to become part of the system, and that's the main reason why the aid is going there. Um, how about Clinton? Now we're going to go about something a little backwards here. We're going to discuss Clinton's cabinet looking more like America in a moment. But before that, how about just who he's appointed in this region? Well, that, they, they've been interesting appointments. The, uh, his chief Middle East advisor is a man named Martin Indyk, mm -hmm. who's actually an Australian. He uh, 
was given citizenship about 10 days before he was appointed so that it would be legitimate. Uh, Enda came to the United States, I think about 10 years ago, and became a, uh, he was appointed by APAC, which is the yeah. registered Israeli lobby. Right. And he worked for the Israeli lobby. And uh, then they decided that it would be useful to have a kind of a think tank Mm -hmm. that's not officially connected with the lobby, right. so it would look more independent, mm -hmm. and it could present that point of their point of view, but with the look of independence. So they spun off this think tank called the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, which mm -hmm. he headed, and it was basically, I mean, nobody, it wasn't a great yeah. secret, it's basically an Israeli propaganda agency, and he moved directly from that to becoming Clinton's uh, chief advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, the next uh, person on the list is Samuel Lewis, who was the, uh, uh, he, he was a uh, U.S. ambassador in Israel, and he was kind of a joke in Israel because he was so, you know, he was sort of like more holy than the Pope, you know, and mm -hmm. when he was there he had his office, he was hobnobbing with the right, you know, right wing and so on and so forth. That's the, the, the this is the, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, that's the main decision-making apparatus, bureaucratic apparatus. And it uh, reflects the, uh, I frankly don't think it's going to have a big policy effect. Uh -huh. uh, here I disagree with others, but uh, it, I would expect Clinton pretty much to follow what's been you, but it's pretty not much. going to improve. I, it's certainly not going, I mean I think he's going to follow the policy that the U.S. has been following for a long time, namely to try to ensure uh, that Israel, which is the main U.S. ally, uh, uh, is the dominant force in the region and can be part of this system that protects, you know, it's called what's called a strategic asset, you know, keeps what they call stability, meaning keep local, prevent local nationalist forces from developing, and they want Egypt to participate in that. The Palestinians mm -hmm. have no role, no rights, uh, and the, they don't contribute to the strategic interests at all, they're just people. And uh, I think that the that's been the framework, and Clinton, if anything, will probably intensify it. Mm -hmm. In your uh, in the film that's out about you, that you said you haven't seen, but I have, uh, which is excellent, and in release right now, and everyone should go see it. Uh, you quote John Jay, one of our beloved founding fathers, mm -hmm. and I found the quote very telling when I thought about Clinton talking about a, a cabinet that looks more like America. And I think that word looks is very yeah. operable because I, you know, it might look more like America, but I certainly don't see any poor people on it. But what was the John, John Jay said? John Jay, his, <coughs> his favorite maxim mm -hmm. was that uh, the people who own the country ought to govern it. He was president of the Constitutional Convention how, and first how upset, the Supreme Court. How upset do you think he would be with the Clinton cabinet? Oh, he's just, they're the people who own the country, all uh -huh. right. In fact, uh, it's uh, biased even more than usual towards wealthy corporate lawyers, investment mm -hmm. bankers, uh, uh, you know, people from Congress who are noted for their cozy relation to major business interests. Uh, uh, Rubin, who's one of the chief economic mm -hmm. advisors, comes from, is the, comes from the largest investment, what is now probably the largest investment firm in the country, Goldman Sachs, and uh, uh, the rest of them are from the same background. The good um, folks at Goldman Sachs. Yeah, right. It's, uh, uh, it's been claimed, I don't know exactly where, the, I think Time Magazine said, claimed that it had more millionaires than uh, any of the, than the, the preceding The staff cabinets. of Time Magazine? Or the no, the, the, oh, the, the journal, uh -huh. I didn't look at their computations, but it's uh, uh -huh. plausible. They got the point whether the details are right. It's a daring story for Time Warner to break. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> speaking of that part of the world, Manhattan, we had the, the, one of the biggest events of the first 100 days. Uh, it's affected a lot of other things, is the uh, World Trade Center bombing. How do you see that? At first I thought it was just an NBC News rehearsal. It got a little bit out of hand. Um, how do you see that? Uh, how, what ramifications do you think that? Well, there is, first of all, the question. I mean, let's, let's assume for the sake of this discussion that the people that they've fingered are the right people. And if that's the case, it let's doesn't say. take a rocket scientist to yeah. blow up the World Trade Center. Well, you know, there's a lot of very strange things yeah, about that explosion. That's a little too uh, For one thing, it's, uh, there's been a 
some interesting discussion about this in the Israeli press, the Hebrew press in Israel, uh -huh. who <coughs> raised some obvious questions. I mean, you know, the, the people who carried out the bombing look as if they wanted to be caught. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, uh, both the, the method of bombing, the trails that they left behind, right. I mean, coming back a couple of times to pick up rental the, car, yeah. uh, money for a hundred dollars for a rental car, yeah. I mean, the connections to, uh, uh, the connections abroad and so on and so forth. And they've pointed out plausibly that there's only two, two possible interpretations. One is that it was just an unbelievably incompetent group of people. I mean, yeah. I mean, even from the kind of bomb that they picked. The gang that couldn't uh, blow up uh, straight, yeah. It's just, so, so that's one possibility, it's just mm -hmm. un unimaginable incompetence. Right. The other possibility is that they were infiltrated by a very professional outfit mm -hmm. uh, who uh, wanted them to expose, who had a purpose. And there are some there were some things bombers you can think on about. a grassy knoll. Well, you know, I mean, it's a it's a kind of, it's a group of people that would not be very. Well, hard how do you to think this plays out? I mean, I, I th right here in Somerville. Now they're talking about not I, which I don't think it means much that this is a quote unquote sanctuary city, except as a gesture. It says you know we, we're not going to harass immigrants in this town. But now they're talking about rescinding that. Yeah. The, the city council is. Well, entertaining I think we should idea. have, and I think it's yeah. we should have. I mean, let's continue to assume that what the FBI says is correct. Mm -hmm. I don't I think it probably is. Uh, one of the interesting things that developed in the World Trade bombing th thing was a letter that was, uh, you know, given front page. Oh yeah. Of times, you know, the from the a group <coughs> that claimed to be responsible, and which some regard as authentic. I mean, no. they, they used Arabic numbers in it. So. Yeah, I mean, there's some questions about yeah. it. Let's assume it to be authentic. Uh -huh. I mean, I, in my opinion, it's probably authentic. Uh -huh. uh, but, well, it's interesting to read it. I mean, what the, if we paid attention to what it said, honestly, we might learn something. So, for example, the core part of, the, of their letter said that uh, the American people should question the role of their government in carrying out or supporting terrorism throughout the world. And if the American people don't question that and do something about it, they too may be subject to terrorism. Well, you know, those are words that we should listen to mm -hmm. uh, because, in fact, they had a point. Uh, the U.S. is uh, one of the major terrorist states in the world. Right. And there are plenty of people around the world who are, uh, you know, who have suffered from U.S.-run terrorism right. and care about it. People here may not care about it, but the victims do. Uh, and they're all over the world. And if you don't have a, the price of a ticket to Baghdad, you can go look at the World Trade Center. It's not, I mean, all through the Middle East, uh, Lebanon, uh, 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 Lebanon, for example, mm -hmm. is, has been a major target right. of U.S., direct U.S., or else U.S. supported right. terror. Uh, Central America and the Caribbean have been targeted for U.S. terror right. operations that go beyond anything that, you know, Libya or Iran could even dream of. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are, in fact, these people were, in fact, correct. Uh, the uh, terrorist operations around the world can often be traced right back to Washington. Uh, in fact, the World Trade Center bombing itself is not an uninteresting example. The, the people who were charged with having carrying it, carried it out, or their intellectual leaders, uh, have pretty good CIA credentials. I mean, they were part of the uh, uh, CIA-funded operation uh, in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, which I mean, I think it had an element of legitimacy. I mean, I think it makes sense to help people resisting foreign invasion. Right, right. However, the people that they picked out, you know, the people that the, the CIA did not pick out, you know, secular nationalists to support. Right. It picked out f radical fundamentalist, fundamentalist. fanatics. Uh, one of them, particularly Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, who was the main, uh, you know, the main beneficiary of CIA support right. has been just tearing the country apart. He's been shelling Kabul, you know, mm -hmm. killing thousands of people, driving out hundreds of thousands uh, after the political settlement. Now, that, these people were all associated with that group, with probably the most radical, fanatic, uh, Islamic fundamentalist group in the world, amply funded by the United States and Saudi Arabia. Well, yeah, trail happened to blow back to New York, if you can believe the FBI. Yeah. But it's only one example of uh, uh, CIA supported, of U.S. supported terrorism throughout yeah, the world. Yeah. Now that's these are the the press commentary on the World Trade Center bombing uh, pr kept. You know, you had things like uh, the United States. We always thought we were voyeurs right. in the world of terrorism. It's something out there. You know, it's well, now we're feeling terror, senseless logic, as if we had nothing to do with it. We have a lot to do with it. 
And we should be honest enough well, to and face is, that. And as if that one instance is the first time there's been any violence in this society. Well, that may, no. do, do people really? I mean, it's feel? true that usually we export our violence. Right. So most of our violence is elsewhere. I mean, but it's a very violent society people internally, with guns, of course. Et I mean, it's an yeah, unbelievably yeah, yeah. violent society internally, but government-supported violence is, of right. course, external. Right, you know, right. I mean, here, fortunately, the government doesn't carry out extensive violence against its own population. Right. We carry out our violence against Although, other Although, you know what I saw on the news this evening? I saw Marines practicing taking uh, uh, urban locations at, at Camp Pendleton. Then they were putting this on television just to show people that yeah, they're ready for the It's king. happened. I mean, the U.S. is not free <coughs> of state violence. Right. So, for example, if you look at U.S. labor history, it's unusually violent. Uh, hundreds of workers were killed in labor actions here at a time when nobody right. was being killed in Europe. But still, it's true that overwhelmingly government-initiated violence is against right, populations of elsewhere, yes. populations in the third world, including large-scale terror operations. And we people here may not know about it, but people elsewhere in the world know very well about it. Right. They're the targets. Yeah, it's no secret. Yeah. Like the secret and bombing in fact, of Cambodia. Yeah, it's pretty read, big news you know, over there. Yeah. It's not news to the right. hundreds of thousands yeah, of peasants who are You can hear killed, those when you know. they go yeah. off. Right. Uh, if we were to pay attention to the contents of this letter, authentic or not, uh, we could learn something from it, if we're honest about it. We have a, uh, a phone call, Dr. Chomsky. Okay. Let me see if I can figure this out. <laughs> No, we don't. Okay. They gave up. They gave up. Or did you, did you uh, cut it off? Are these the numbers? 628-8829 or 628-8826? Oh, 628-8826. I didn't give okay. away the secret uh, lucky control room number, I think. Okay. So see, if anyone wants to if call, they can. And not be cut off, maybe. Oh, uh, they weren't. Yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I think they had given up. Oh, had they? Okay. Well, maybe this is them. Is that it? Are they they Okay, okay, fine. Well, there seems to be some flashing now. <clears throat> well, what do you think about the cabinet in general, the cabinet appointments? Uh, the, well, how about the uh, uh, the whole attorney general uh, fiasco? Yeah, that was a, I mean, he made political errors, but there was something pretty cynical about that. I mean, yeah. whatever you think about Zoe Baird. I mean, if those Attorney General Electric. I mean, if those condition. I mean, yes, right. starting with who she was. But it's what, who she worked for that I cared about. Yeah, at, uh, it wasn't that she didn't do anything yeah. immoral. She only exploited right. immigrants. She yeah, wasn't. Sure. She wasn't. Uh, but you know, the the kind of uh, uh, infraction that she was picked up on. I mean, of not, not many people would remain in government if right. you. If you right. Kind of, on the other hand, her own. You know, neither her background is not very pretty, Whatever, nor, the yeah. current what, yeah. nor the current attorney general. Well, she sent a lot of people yeah. to the electric chair, hasn't she? Here, let me just try this again. Hello? Uh, hello, how do you do? Good, how are you tonight? Who's calling? Uh, my name is Logan Evans. Uh, I have a geopolitical theory which calls for a global U.S. system, the world divided into states in which everybody would have a vote within the U.S. system, a global democracy. I'm just wondering what Mr. Chomsky thinks about that, whether he thinks the U.S. system could be a global system in which everybody could vote for a global president in Congress. Well, I'd like to start with something simpler, turning the U.S. system into a, a U.S. democracy, which it's very far from. Uh, as I mean, we do have the right to push, uh, you know, to push levers every couple of years, but the question is whether. Uh, the population actually can play a meaningful role in managing its own affairs, and I don't think it does. Uh, all we, that we've been talking about illustrates that. Uh, popular, for example, popular attitudes are very different from the r spectrum of uh, government policies. Uh, the population is expected to simply be observers. Uh, they are what are called uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders in uh, uh, the way the theories are designed. Uh, so we, we could start by trying to create a meaningful democracy here before we start exporting what we have. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling. We have another call. Let's see if I can do this twice in a row. Hello, you're on Dead Air Live. Hello. Um, Who's calling? Is, yeah, this is Justin. I have a question for Dr. Chomsky, I believe. Okay, speak yes, up. Uh, yeah, my question is that um, do you think that there's a possibility that um, President Aristide might or will go back uh, as the um, president of Haiti? Well, I certainly hope that he'll go back, but if you want my speculation, it's of course a speculation, 
My speculation is that the arrangement that is now being crafted uh, will have him be, be the official president, whether he stays here or goes back under protection, uh, but with a prime minister uh, who will have effective power and who will represent the interests of traditional elites and uh, uh, you know the U.S. businesses who run assembly plants there and on the plantations and so on. I hope that that doesn't happen, but if but I think that that's what is uh, going to happen. What the U.S. so far at least uh, has strongly opposed is the popular grassroots movement, uh, which uh, which swept him into power with two thirds of the vote. That. Uh, U.S. businessmen and the Haitian elites don't like any at all. Uh, so what I'd anticipate is a formal arrangement in which he'll be a kind of a figurehead president. And unless we do something here to stop that, I think that's what's likely to come. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, possibly uh, one thing on the upside with the first hundred days of the Clinton presidency, some reasonable signs you were discussing before with uh, social policy? Uh, there, there, by and large, the Republicans and the Democrats have <coughs> the same general policies. They're just factions of it. They're kind of a business party, and they're just two factions of it. Uh, so their prime commitment on major issues is to the welfare of uh -huh. the rich, uh, investors, owners, and managers, and so on. And they don't differ much in that respect. But they do differ in the kind of popular constituency that they appeal to. So the Republicans are somewhat more openly the business party. They don't pretend mm -hmm. to be anything else. Uh, as a result, they don't have an e traditionally, they have not had an easy appeal to the majority of the population. I mean, you can't go to the majority of the population and say, you know, hey guys, we want to enrich the rich, as the Reaganites did for the last 10 years. One of the reasons why Reagan is uh, the most unpopular living president next to Nixon. He and Nixon are tied, for, sort of tied for last place. Oh, really? I haven't, I haven't yeah, seen that. It's been kept kind of like quiet. Yeah. In fact, you'd be surprised. You know who the most popular ex-president? Probably Carter. Carter, by a long shot. Ford is second. And He's our only, very best ex-president. Yeah, uh, Ford people vote for because they don't remember who he was. East Timor, they don't though. remember him. You know, they don't know who he was. They figure <coughs> he couldn't have been too bad. But Nixon and Reagan bring up the the rear. Mm -hmm. and in any event, they you and know the, well they should. Yeah, but the the you can't go to the public and try to garner votes that way. So mm -hmm. the way that the Republicans tend to develop mass appeal is by appealing to racism or jingoism or religious fundamentalism right. or something like that. Fair enough. And, and they get, you know, you can get pretty big groups that way in a troubled sure. society. The Democrats, on the other hand, claim to be the popular party. Mm -hmm. uh, their policies aren't all that different when they get right. in, but they do appeal to different constituencies. They try to organize, mobilize, uh, to vote, not to act. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, labor, working people, uh, women, uh, ethnic minorities, right. uh, you know, the elderly, and so on. Now, when the parties get into power on issues that are of crucial interest to the business community, they don't really differ very much, right. say NAFTA. Uh, on the other hand, on issues that are not of great significance to the business community, say civil rights, they do differ. There they you know, they sort of throw crumbs to their constituency. So a Republican administration, as we saw in the last 10 years, is going to uh, be very harsh uh, with regard to things like civil rights. In fact, it's going to be repressive. You know, it's going to, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to, to introduce censorship, to, uh, right. uh, to introduce harsh punishments, mm -hmm. uh, to make it Im difficult, even impossible, sometimes to bring civil rights issues to the courts. Uh, uh, it'll uh, uh, restrict um, uh, the right of free choice for women about abortion. I mean, things like that are the kinds of things you'd expect it to do given its popular constituency. The Democrats, with their popular constituency, will not do that. Mm -hmm. So I'd expect, and we already see, an improvement in the civil rights climate, but more, more protection for human rights and civil <coughs> rights, mm -hmm. uh, for people's freedom of choice, uh, for I mean, family leave, for example. I mean, business doesn't care much one way or another, but that's, but working people do care. Right. Uh, that, that kind of thing happened. And, and that's the kind of, in these domains, the parties do carry out different policies. Now those, 
those differences are very important for human life. You know, I don't mean to play them down. Right. On the other hand, they don't matter much to people, uh, to the people who own the country and therefore govern it. Right. So therefore, they can change. Right. And in in the area of social policy, I would expect uh, changes of a kind that at least I would regard as an improvement. Some improvement. We have another. I, I often say there's a nickel's worth of difference between Democrats and Republicans. Yeah. And what there's, if I took the nickel and put it on the table, a Democrat would steal it from me, <laughs> and a Republican would kill me for it. <laughs> okay, let's see. Hi, you're on Dead Air Live. Who's calling? Hi, this is Leonard Diggins calling. Hi. And I'm in Somerville now, and if I could talk on or, or ask about two issues, I'd like to, but if not, I understand. Go ahead. And I'll deal with let's see if we get to it. Okay. Uh, the first one is based on a comment that Noam made about we not having a democracy now and making decisions more open to the public. I am curious as to how he would imagine getting from where we are now to there without making the situation a lot worse than it perhaps is. And let me just add that I'm hard pressed to think that most people would be capable of making the technical decisions that often go into a lot of legislation. I certainly don't, and I, I spend a lot of time following the news. So that's the first issue. Okay, let's start with that. Well, uh, let's take the, I, I don't think it's a very difficult problem. First of all, I, I have, uh, I, uh, I, I don't share your skepticism about people's ability to uh, uh, think through problems and make decisions about things that matter to them. I mean, it's true they have to have access to information and they have to have interaction with one another and they have to have opportunities to discuss and so on, but you know, that's what organizations are about. And I don't know of any reason to believe that the people who do make the decision are any more qualified. They just have different interests. They make the decisions uh, uh, with different interests in mind. Now, how can these things happen? Well, take the two examples that we started, that we began to discuss, uh, you know, at the beginning of the program. Take, say, healthcare and, and NAFTA. Take those two issues. On both of those issues, the general public has opinions which happen to be different uh, from the spectrum of, a, of the, the spectrum of policy choices. On the health care issue, the public has not been organized and has not acted in any way to try to realize what they want. So therefore, they're not going to get it. On the case of NAFTA, there happens to be a network of uh, groups, uh, environmental groups, uh, labor groups, uh, religious-based groups, and others, which have uh, functioned to, tr to, you know, to, to articulate a, a point of view, to develop and articulate a point of view from based on grassroots participation and to put it into the public arena by pressure, and they're getting somewhere. Well, that's the way democracy works. That's the way every, uh, uh, every social change that's been worthwhile has come about. These things are not given uh, as gifts by uh, you know, experts or uh, benevolent autocrats. They're struggled for and fought for. And that's, why, that's how labor got the right to organize in the first place in the mid-1930s. Even in those cases, though, usually the decisions come about through representation. I mean, I'm a member of a union myself, and often we elect representatives who make decisions. We, the membership, get to talk to our representatives, but in the end, especially when it's a close call, I mean, there's someone who then represents you mm -hmm. to the board, and so I see in almost any case we'll have to end up with a representative form of government and but if not they don't represent see, the you well, get the a issue new I don't think is the rep I mean any form of governance <clears throat> is going to be representative. I mean you're not going to get 200 million people sitting in a room and making a decision. So there'll be representation. The question is who controls. I hear you. Like in your union, the question is, do you determine the decisions and does your representative do what you say? Or does your representative do what he or she wants and you just sort of read about it in the papers? Okay, well, thank you very much. I got two questions on the same subject. I think I'll turn the call yeah. phone over to someone else. Okay, thank you. Okay. Looks like the phones are cool. Uh, um, let's see what we haven't covered here. Yeah, I sort of got thrust into this <laughs> this evening. Um, Oh, I know what I wanted. I wanted to promote something. On September 28th, uh, I'll be doing a benefit at Johnny D's uh, for the uh, 
a sister city program in El Salvador, raising money. And you know what? That There's brings up an interesting, yeah. Uh huh. What's happening in El Salvador is important. Yeah, very, the amnesty and worth paying attention. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, what very telling. In, it's extremely important. I mean, the uh, uh, the, uh, the the there was a peace treaty, which stopped the fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, the peace, one a crucial part of the peace treaty was establishing what was called a truth commission. Uh, United Nations run Truth Commission, mm -hmm. uh, which would investigate a sample, a small sample of the atrocities conducted in the last decade. And they did conduct an, uh, a rather detailed inquiry into a number of the atrocities and discovered uh, something which will come as absolutely no surprise to people who have been following the story outside the mainstream. Right. Uh, Namely, that a, a, they attributed 85% of the atrocities to the security forces, right. another 10% to the paramilitary forces, mm -hmm. the death squads, which are associated with the government right. and the big business right. interests. So that means 95% were attributed to the, uh, the people we supported, right. we trained, armed, directed, and supported, mm -hmm. uh, and 5% were attributed to the guerrillas. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, another part of the peace treaty was that people who are uh, implicated in crimes must be punished for them. Right. Uh, the first thing that the government did was to pass an amnesty right. which exonerated almost all people, not only mm -hmm. those who had committed crimes, but those who were implicated through the right. Truth Commission or later investigations. So that eliminated the threat of punishment, thereby undermining the peace treaty. Uh, but they, it's interesting what they excluded. Uh, not everybody was uh, under the amnesty. I mean, it, it right. turned out that this group of people who they call internationally protected persons, well, that means American military who are there advising the killers. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if somebody shot at them, that's not, uh, if you killed American church women, that's okay. Right. But if you shot at an American Marine, that's not okay. Right. That's an interesting decision. I mean, that's just, that would be scandalous by international standards. Oh, well, of course, I mean, and, yeah. and it is. And well, the question is, do we care about it? Are right. we going to act it was very interesting. to make sure that this a piece that really prompted up the xenophobic fear of uh, people entering our country at the beginning, and and then the last piece, and then in between they had some fluff piece, and at the the last piece was about Salvador, hmm. and if you watched it in the opposite order, you would know why people would flee countries to come here. Yeah. A lot of a lot of these foreigners that we're so afraid of are in fact fleeing U.S. foreign policy, and ironically, well, this is the I safe mean, haven. Know, there are tens of thousands of people who are slaughtered there in U.S. armed and directed terror. Uh, there was an interesting comment about this by the, uh, uh, the one, one of the last major seconds. Yeah, crimes was the killing of the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. The person who replaced the rector of the university the, his, uh, pointed out that there's somebody missing in this whole scenario, namely the U.S. government. We, that's our responsibility. And. Uh, and you keep an eye on all our responsibilities and inform those of us that try to be responsible. And it's a pleasure and an honor to appear with you on Dead Air Live Thank tonight. You. Dr. Chomsky, we'll see you around the campus. Good to see you. You had one minute to say anything you wanted to President Bush. What would it be? Uh, I would tell him, uh, as important as he thinks the social issues, the social uh, areas are, to put that aside for the time being. Uh, the question, you know, the controversial social issues about gay, gays in the military and all that. Uh, I, I, I don't diminish the importance that has to the people who are directly involved, but uh, other things like uh, where, where the next paycheck is coming from are probably what you should concentrate on. Well, originally, I'm from Haiti, so one thing I'd like to say to him is that um, that he helped the um, Haitian people or the country, Haiti, and get Aristide back. Yeah, that's what I'd like to say, though. I'll stay true to what you believe in. I say good luck. <laughs> good luck.